Good evening, Prescott Valley. Welcome to the Parks and Recreation Commission regular meeting of Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. Kathy, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Brinkman? Here. Commissioner Fallman? Here. Commissioner Byram? Here. Commissioner Gorman? Here. Commissioner Pierce? Here. Um, if everybody's had a chance to look at the agenda, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move that we approve the agenda for November 12, 2019. And a second? Second. Mr. Chairman, can I make one addition to your agenda this evening? Well, you know, this one time we might allow it, but it's going to depend on what it is. Well, I appreciate that. The subject matter uh, staff is requesting would be the addition of uh, approval for a work study on Tuesday, November 19th, 4 p.m., be held over at the Civic Center, and its singular purpose would be to allow for uh, commission orientation uh, process. Okay, we'll put that under item 12. How's that? That would be lovely. Okay. Thank you. So then a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of the work study on Tuesday, November 19th, 4 p.m. And do we have a second for that? Yes. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that carries. Then we need a motion to approve the minutes for October 8, 2019. These are the regular meeting minutes. I move that we approve the minutes of October 8th, 2019, regular meeting. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Then we need a motion to approve the October 14th, 2019, work study meeting minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve <laughs> the work study minutes of October 14th, 2019. And a second? I'll second that as well. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that carries. Moving on, then we're up to scheduled announcements, and this brings Brian right up to the stage. Good evening, commissioners. Just a quick uh, listing of review of some programs, classes, and special events that are upcoming in the months of November, December, and we're even going to trickle a little bit into January. So believe it or not, life is happening fast. If you have not done it already, please consider applying to Create a Tree. This is our annual program in which uh, trees or represent representations of trees, creative illustrations, uh, celebrating your club, business, school, uh, association, you name it. It is a lovely opportunity to help decorate the Civic Center as well as the library during the holiday months. Applications are due November 18th. You can find more information as well as the application form online at pvaz.net. Or if you have any questions, please give Isabella Tuning a call at 759-3127. In addition, a few of our new classes. We have a card making class. Uh, this is happening at the Civic Center. It's $20 per class and it makes up to four greeting cards during that session. We also have evening drawing workshops. Uh, these uh, running throughout the month from 5 to 7 p.m. We have fun with clay. Uh, these are alternating Fridays, 10 a.m. to noon at the Civic Center uh, with all skill levels available, ages 15 and up as well as fun with clays for the kids. And these are on Fridays from 4 to 5.30 over at the Civic Center for ages 8 to 17. For more information on these programs and classes, you can give us a call at 759-3090 or visit online at pvaz.net where you'll be able to click on our programs, classes, and events button and complete online registration if you would so choose. Also like to announce that Coming soon, actually November 28th, it's just right around the corner, will be the Valley of Lights in Fane Park. This is a cooperative hosting uh, between the town as well as the Prescott Valley Chamber of Commerce that leads this event. It runs Thursday, November 28th through Monday, December 30th, 6 to 10 p.m. each evening. 
and a special opportunity of a holiday stroll. On Tuesday, December 3rd, 6 to 9 p.m., this is a walk through along the road that you can take. It has carolers, hot chocolate, and Santa at the end. Parking will be held up on 2nd Street with shuttling down below. And then no charge, uh, but donations are greatly accepted, not only for the stroll, but also the entire duration of Valley of the Lights there in Fane Park. Festival of Lights is coming to us on Friday, December 6th. This is from 4.30 to 8 p.m. This is the lighting of the Civic Center campus, as well as a couple of other activities we'll talk in following. Uh, but for more information on this, you can give us a call again at 759-3090, but we encourage everyone to come out and enjoy the lighting of the Civic Center campus. Along with the lighting, Pictures with Santa is available for all of our young people and young at heart. Uh, again, Friday, December 6th, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. This will be in the third floor activity room right here at the Civic Center. This is a free of charge opportunity, so come on out. We also have winter volleyball signups. Registrations are now open and will take place all the way through December 20th. The leagues fill quickly, so do not delay or hesitate. The league will operate January 7th through March 12th at the Glassford Hill Middle School. Tuesdays we have co-ed A and B divisions, Wednesday women's A and B divisions, and Thursdays women A and men's A divisions. And please mark your calendar. January 4th, 2020, we'll be hosting the Polar Bear Splash out at Mountain Valley Splash. So be prepared to take the dare. We enjoy everyone coming out. And if you would like to become a sponsor for the 2020 session, we would love to talk to you. Give us a buzz again, 759-3090 as we had a record-setting number of bears last year. We had a goal of 40, and I think we ended up with 59. So hopefully we can continue that trend. Lots of fun out there with some eating contests, our ice princess, all kinds of goodies. So you'll have tons more information coming soon. But mark your calendars for January 4th. And last but not least, I do believe we'd like to announce the opening of our daddy-daughter date night activity. This will be held Friday, February 1st, 6 to 9 p.m. at the event spot right here in Prescott Valley. These are for youngsters ages 3 through 12 to come along with their dad, their significant uh, guardian. Uh, whatever the case might be. There are some very limited uh, dress code requirements, but you can visit us online at pvaz.net uh, to register or give us a call at the office 759-3090. And that concludes our programs and special events announcements. That's kind of amazing that we're already talking about the polar bear splash. But, you know, the good thing is that we have three new commissioners that will be able to lead that. Correct. You know, they can be the first in and test the water and, yes. you know, you. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But, you know, hopefully they can do it in the same style and, and spectacle or, sp well, not spectacle, <laughs> uh, speciality that uh, Elaine brought when she jumped in that on her first year. So, yes. yes. And yes. also won the best beard contest. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, moving on, then we're going to have the uh, Boys and Girls Club. We're finally going to have a uh, grand opening on Saturday, November 23rd. And that will be held right there at the Boys and Girls Club. That is located right at the corner of Robert Road and Loose Drive. Uh, we'll be meeting from 1 to 3. Encourage everyone to come out. It's a grand opening. So in other words, we're throwing the doors open. We've got lots of fun and festivities involved. Uh, we've got some inflatables. Uh, we also have the mascots from the Suns coming out and joining with us. Coaches will be on site. We'll be conducting some clinics and skills uh, development and analysis us out there for all light refreshments uh, some good words from our leadership here at the town the boys and girls club uh, and as well as recognize, recognizing uh, the Fane family for their contributions and the naming of this local branch is the Fane family branch for the boys and girls club of central Arizona so come out uh, enjoy check out the new floor it sports all the fast fantastic colors of the Phoenix Suns and the Northern Arizona Suns, and that the reason for it is that the Suns Employee Foundation contributed the dollars for the gymnasium floor there. 
Uh, so a great sponsorship and support coming from that organization and the facilities development. So come on out. Enjoy yeah, it. Check it out. Again, Saturday, November 23rd, 1 to 3 p.m., Boys and Girls Club, Central Arizona, Fane Family Branch. We're, we're always excited about the Boys and Girls Club. They serve so many families in the community and do, do such good work. This expansion really expands their capabilities as well. So, and we truly appreciate the help that the Fane Foundation gave us in completing that, so. Okay, moving on to department updates. Um, Brian, are you going to introduce our new commissioners? I mean, they're already voting, so <laughs> do we have with, to introduce them too? Without a doubt, I'd love to. So tonight we have with us, uh, taking the bench, if you will, for the first time this evening, uh, we have Commissioner Scott Byram joining us, uh, Commissioner Kay Gorman, and Commissioner Bill Pierce. Uh, Scott is filling uh, the position uh, in which Pat Freyer uh, did not renew after six years of service to the commission. Uh, so thank you, Scott, for that opportunity. Uh, Ms. Kay Gorbin, she came on board. Uh, she took uh, the position uh, vacated by Commissioner Kevin Trevini, who moved back to Michigan to be closer to family on those opportunities. And Mr. Bill Pierce joined us uh, filling the term uh, left when uh, Ms. Lori Moss uh, was appointed to the town council. So with that, I would encourage, uh, in the order of Scott, Kay, and Bill, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves uh, to the, uh, your fellow commissioners in the community in regards to uh, your uh, desire to serve and, and welcome and congratulations on your appointments. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm Sc Scotty Byram. I go by Scotty. It's a little... I always thought Scott was harsh, you know, just in Scots, you know, like a little <laughs> German. So I always felt awkward to uh, introduce myself. So Scotty, please, uh, I'd love to, you know, break the barrier with, you know, what, with like a joke, but like I really want to like be a, like a close-knit group where we can run ideas off each other and, 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 you know, really be like in a friendly manner. That's what I hope to bring, you know, a certain youthfulness to the group. Uh, I feel I, uh, I have you a couple of years, uh, so I, I'd like to use that, you know, use my insights to, to help with, you know, your already vast knowledge and experience of how things are done and see if I could, you know, give a, a new take or, a, you know, a somewhat different take that might resonate with the younger crowd. So I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Grant, glad to have you. Uh, I'm Kay Gorman. Moved here three years ago, and uh, this is the last community I plan to be in, and I wanted to learn more about it, so I figured the way to do that is to serve. Uh, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Bill Pierce, I really enjoy being on the commission. I've uh, been in town 10 years now, and I'm still a youthful hiker, Scotty, so. <laughs> it's on, it's on the inside. And I like to bicycle, and I'm uh, looking forward to just being on the commission. Well, welcome to all of you, and you're coming at a really exciting time. As you know, we're updating the master plan as Michael's going to present some very uh, interesting information. And this is a big time as we look to the future and, say, the next 10 years. And as, Scotty, your comments, we are always looking toward youth, it, you know, and we learn all the time. We've built really our first inclusive playground this last year, and we're looking to, looking to do better. We're just always want the community to come in and give us more ideas. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. And with that, we're going to move on to the director's report. Um, did you have anything, Brian, or is it just questions? It, you're exactly right. I have nothing further to add to this uh, month's report, but I am happy to answer any questions that the commission uh, may have in regards to both mine and the department's report as a whole. I didn't have any. I don't know if anybody oh, else had any. any. Um, typically what we do is we read down through his report. It has like 800 items in it. I don't know. <laughs> and then <laughs> once in a while you find something. I wonder what that is about. And this is the opportunity to find out. Okay. And then the uh, chairperson's report. We do not have one this time. So we're going to move on to tree advisory board business. 
Yes, as a matter of conversation uh, over the course of a couple of different meetings, uh, we reviewed a number of different items related to our living tree uh, and uh, commemorative bench program. This is basically an update of our former uh, program, uh, which was not inclusive of benches, but it was our memorial tree. And in that review, uh, we really wanted to really investigate the context of that program. Memorial is after, unfortunately, and uh, the commission as well as the Friends Foundation really looked at uh, the opportunities that were being missed here. So uh, we went through, reorganized, revamped the program in regards to a living tree uh, program uh, that really focuses on the full cycle of uh, opportunity uh, that's available here. So we took that to vantage point, adopted it to this program so that you can celebrate uh, the birth of a child or a grandchild. If you would like to commemorate a wedding or those types of things, or you would like to memorialize a loved one lost uh, through that process. Uh, so a fantastic opportunity in regards to reinvigorating this program with a, uh, again, a 360 view of, of opportunity here. We also looked at some of our pricing structures uh, that we have. Uh, so this gives you a three-tiered process if you would like to donate the tree uh, in two different uh, sizes, as well as then also look at a tree that also has that commemorative plaque aspect to it. Uh, so we've priced it uh, through that process. Uh, then we looked at the donation of a bench, a uh, lot of uh, needed sitting area in a variety of different locations throughout our park system, uh, especially uh, being that the focus on this is locating the bench next to a variety of our different facilities that we have at the park. So whether that be a playground or pickleball courts or what uh, walking path, any of those types of facilities that a nice resting area would be very uh, appreciated and appropriate. Uh, that's what we'll focus on here again. Um, it also allows for the commemoration of recognition. So if your company would like to donate it or you would like to do a family donation or in remembrance of someone, you have those opportunities. We've also standardized the process in regards to how those uh, folks are recognized through that commemorative plaque process. Um, and the benefit, we haven't had a friends group back when we started this program, we do today. So those contributions are being made to a 501c3. So it, it helps add uh, to the benefit of the contributor as well too. Um, so a nice, good, all around program. Uh, this is our update. Uh, we'll be taking these materials, making them available online. We're also uh, reprinting. Uh, so the updated product here, so folks can see us online, they can receive it through handouts at our different various events and activities. Uh, online will be also the uh, uh, fillable form, uh, so folks can go ahead and fill those out and make their contributions directly to the friend, uh, Friends uh, program. So. That is just an update that uh, Commissioner Gummer asked that I provide, letting uh, everyone know that it's moving forward as uh, discussed and being fulfilled. Yeah, this is really a great revision to the plan. It was an effective program before, but this makes it even better and covers a wide spectrum. Uh, people can go out and find a spot that they like in any park, really, and then we'll consider it and, and go from there. But this is a great improvement. Okay, let's move on to old business and Santa Fe Station Park update. That is definitely old business. <laughs> well, it will be continuing business as well. Uh, wanted to provide everyone an update. If you were driving by off of Glassford Hill, you probably saw a lot of people this weekend. And that was the beauty of it. We've known that our inclusive playground has been open and available for a couple of weeks now. We've been waiting on our pickleball courts. And they have been colored and striped and the yeah, gates pretty. were open and folks were having fun. So we'll have a big announcement in regards to those opportunities being made available. Um, to the public to go out and use with the also the understanding that it is still a construction site. There's a variety of different things that are still to come. Uh, as you know, we're working on growing the uh, uh, turf that's yeah. out there. 
uh, some of our upcoming uh, events and activities out there. We have a service road that we still need to put in that allows our utility groups to get back to the well sites. Uh, we also have some concrete work in regards to a, a connecting sidewalks, also some containment curbing that we have for our turf area out there. Uh, currently happening, uh, the developers, uh, contractors providing the landscaping work and also the parking lot install, so that will be happening as well as the power connectivity to the park site. Uh, hopefully December, January, uh, we'll be flying the restrooms into place. And then in the January, February timeframe, our Ramada uh, will come into play. So we'll be wrapping those things up. Uh, hopefully, uh, come spring, there's a few following uh, elements that are gonna trickle into the next fiscal year for park completion. Uh, but we're hoping, hoping that, uh, that sometime April, May, uh, whether it coincides with our annual uh, Arbor Day event on uh, April 26th this year, I think it is. Could be wrong, it's the last That's Friday close. in April. Give, give or take a week. Um, but uh, whether it coincides with our annual Arbor Day program and event uh, there at the park or not, it'll be somewhere close in that proximity of April and May. Because uh, we're going to have to come back in, do an overseeding of the park, uh, really start to fill it in and uh, grow it healthy and crazy so that we can have all kinds of fun rolling around. So, uh, But that's tentative, uh, more or less the schedule in regards to some of the additional refinements. And again, I caution folks, we do have some temporary fencing out there and that's just to help benefit the grass that's growing and then also give some of our workers and contractors the elbow room that they need. Real quick, Brian, will the pickleball with all of its um, attraction be strictly, um, what's the word I want to use? Recreational? Is it going to be brought into the system of sports we offer and like tournaments and teams develop through these courts? Our focus is really to leave the courts open for open play, but building through that instructional programs and services. So, so it could be like a good way to get people together at exactly. one time and like meet your neighbor yeah. and whatnot through the sport. As well as learn how to play. Yeah. <clears throat> so that we're going to have those types of uh, opportunities there. Um, but then also for those folks that do know how to play, um, it's also going to be part of our reservation system. So much like a baseball field or a football field or a yeah. soccer field, folks can reserve and they'll be blocked into periods of time that they can do that. Yeah. Um, but we're also going to help people um, go through that acclimation process of how the pickleball courts work. We're probably going to have some structured activity, those types of things, and okay. put those pieces together. So, Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Brian, once it's completed, are we going to have like a grand opening? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. So that would be the, the full unveil. Um, so definitely after restrooms, Ramada, uh, the roadway construction, the connective sidewalks, those types of things. Uh, again, whether that coincides with Arbor Day uh, or just after, but that's, that's what nice. we're roughly looking at. Yeah. But there'll still be some trickling things that we still have to do into the new fiscal year, which will start in July, so. Okay. So did you say we were gonna have power fairly soon? That's what I'm hoping. Uh, we still have some uh, boring activity to do. Not, not that it is boring, but boring uh, for uh, the uh, conduit and uh, hookup of the power extension. So it's gonna be coming from across the road, or at least tentatively, that's the way we understand it right now. Um, so that will be good for the parking lot lights. Um, and then once the restroom's in place, it connects in and from the restrooms, the pickleball courts connect in for their lights. So it'll be a, a part of a trickling process there. Do we have the signage up yet for the pickleball? The, main, the pickleball court signage is coming. Uh, the main uh, park signage is under development right now. Um, so it's. I meant the rules and regulations. Yep, for rules, regu okay. regulations, registration, all of that kind of stuff, yes. Okay. 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 Um, the next item is Mountain Valley Park off leash improvement update. Yes. So October 25th, our uh, 
young scouts and many volunteers came to pass so quickly. I just had some images that I wanted to be able to show to you. Uh, this first image is uh, an aerial view because uh, we were able to also uh, help our scouts learn about drones and flying and all of the, re the regulations that go into that. They were able to actually fly the drone themselves too for just a moment, uh, taking a peek at all of these good things. But this is a top-down image. This is a pre uh, volunteer work. Uh, this is a post uh, volunteer work and you see quite a few uh, added amenities, new amenities, cleanup. There's about 90 tons of uh, decomposed granite that was put into place. Uh, six trees uh, were added. Um, lots of varying different uh, elements came into place. Um, on your left hand, uh, where you see the blue framework, that was a pre. On your right, uh, you're seeing the post uh, efforts that were made, so you see a lot of changeover and additions uh, in regards to the work that was done out there. This is the small dog park side. Our next image is showing you the large dog park side. And again, you can see a number of the different updates in regards to the amenities there. More uh, picnic tables and benches were brought in, um, but a ton of work uh, that I believe they said 37 or 39 volunteers in total um, were out there contributing that morning for about five hours in total, uh, getting all of this work done. Uh, there were some uh, pre-constructive elements uh, that were put into place by town park staff, um, but the majority of the moving and shaking and painting and raking and picking up and everything that you can think of uh, took place within that five-hour window of those 40-some-odd folks that were there on site. Uh, so a big wolf of a thank you to the National Association <laughs> of Realtors, the Prescott Area Association of Realtors, because they were the ones that helped facilitate a $4,500 grant that went into this project. The scouts themselves uh, also found approximately, we're, we've not finished the total count, uh, but we're guesstimating of somewhere between an additional two to $2,500 worth of materials uh, that they were able to realize, as well as the many volunteers that were out there. But also a big thank you to our two newest buddies, and this was Benson and Colby. Um, they, they met some of our commissioners, made a big presentation, uh, but it was just fantastic to work with them, uh, their parents, the volunteers that they assembled and put together because this was many uh, weeks of development, um, review, uh, survey creation, going out and engaging businesses and supporters and, uh, and tons of things. So kudos to these two young men and all of the help that they had behind that. So, Do you know if it was on their way to a badge? Uh, this is uh, transitioning them from Life Scouts to Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're wanting to put a bow on all of this. They're actually going to uh, this Thursday's council meeting as their uh, wrap-up presentation, uh, much as uh, per the commission's request is make sure that we get that uh, happening in that conversation of engagement with council. And then uh, we're going to go through final reporting, and I'll provide uh, sign-off on there. Uh, but we do have a few little elements that they're still working on. And uh, one of our scouts has pledged some continual uh, monitoring uh, for the remainder of the school year in addition to that, too. So It looks like they did a really excellent job. You know, it, it turned out really good. But um, we, the town and Parks and Rec has a longstanding um, relationship with the scouts. They have done many projects and with the town and this one um, Benson and Colby came and wanted to improve the dog park and they did really an excellent job they went out and got a grant they did a survey of the users to see what people wanted and it turned out really nice and we've had those relationships as long as I can remember and we have we, we really have appreciate it and they're very valuable We've had a Thank number of scouts that have done uh, trail restoration work yeah. for us, those types of things. Matter of fact, one was just wrapping things up this last weekend uh, with trail work that was done over in Fain Park. We have another one inquiring about another uh, branch of the trail system out there, too. So doing some of those uh, fine jobs. So Really good, John. Are they any good at leaf blowing? 
uh, in need of that around my house. So. <laughs> Work that out somehow. That'd be appreciated. Hey, you're uh, still new. I know, right? Yeah. Behave yourself. <laughs> okay, let's move on to new business. And the first item is a master plan update. Okay, so this wonderful gentleman behind me, Mr. Mike Svetz from Pros Consulting, is here to give us a little bit of an update as it relates to not only our community stakeholders, our public engagement meetings, but also newly uh, results coming in from our community survey that was conducted by ETC. So Mike has a number of different items that he will share with us tonight as a matter of update on our master plan. So without further ado, Mr. Mike. Okay, I need to lower this because I'm not as tall as him. It's up here for you all. Okay, thank you um, so much for the opportunity to kind of. This is, I think, our second installment of coming back to you all. The first was kind of the the general overview of the process, and for those of you that are new. <laughs> um, it, it, it there's uh, I will try to summarize it. There's the community need side of the equation, which is what we're going to discuss today. Um, there is the technical component. Um, some of that work parallels when we do the uh, community needs. And so conditions of parks, um, future projections for park acreage, how well your parks are distributed. Um, and then the third is really where the recommendations come in. So strategically, both operationally and um, in terms of how you develop your park system to, to meet your growing community. So tonight um, is kind of, you're in good space with regards to being relatively new because this is kind of the first set of what I would call kind of key finding information that we're sharing with you all and the public. Uh, we are gonna share the same presentation tomorrow evening with the Art and Culture Commission and then on Thursday evening with Town Council. So um, tonight uh, is really these kind of key components, uh, influencing factors, which is really demographic information, um, summarization of all of the focus group and stakeholder meetings that took place um, last spring, as well as later this summer, including a public meeting. Um, just to kind of give you an overview of the uh, the website participation. We do have a standalone website specific for this project where we capture all of the information and the public can go to it. They will be able to, at the end of this week, see this presentation uh, there as well. Um, the statistically valid survey results, uh, as well as then kind of taking all of this public input and, and starting to put it into prioritization of needs, and then we'll share with you the next steps. So just some demographics and trends. This information is a compilation of data that comes from the town, uh, comes from the town's uh, general plan 2025, as well as a um, the global leader in data and market um, in, in, gathering, I guess is probably a good way to say it. Um, it is called the Environmental Systems Research Institute. Um, they are uh, uh, affectionately uh, labeled ESRI. Um, so if you wanted to look them up and look and see whether your community likes to um, uh, 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 eat at Burger King or McDonald's, you can do that. <laughs> They're that dialed in. Um, but um, so what I wanted to just share with you is just kind of an understanding of where you're at from a population perspective. And you can see that the town is growing. Um, you're currently roughly estimated at about 50,000 folks. Um, and with a 1.7% uh, growth rate, um, and if that holds true, uh, by 2034, 2035, you'll be close to 95,000 people um, and still a town. Uh, a, the U.S. average annual growth rate is 0.8%. So you are growing at a rate twice that any other place in the country is doing. And the other key component associated with this is in the general plan update, there were three kind of what I would call um, scenarios associated with the town growing. 
Um, one was just kind of a trend, and that was based on how the uh, town had been growing in the past. Another one was moderate, which was kind of in the middle. And the third one was, I think, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily labeled aggressive, but it was um, faster growing than, than what we're showing here. From an age segmentation perspective, you're fairly balanced. Um, and yet you are uh, with a slight aging trend. Uh, so basically what this means is that by 2034, uh, about 36% of your population will be 55 and older. Um, however, you're still going to be hovering around 20% for the other age segments, meaning school age kids or under the age of 17, under the age of 18 will make up about 20% of your population as well as young adults as well as middle age so that's um, that's a good balance um, you know we did a master plan for the city of Scottsdale uh, about three four years ago and just by comparison their 55 and older um, population was projected to be over 50% of the population, um, I think somewhere by 2030. So you're aging, but you're not certainly aging like some other communities in Arizona are. Um, as far as ethnicity goes, we always want to take a look at um, race and ethnicity because we know that that equates to culture and that also equates to parks and recreation experiences. Um, you're primarily a white alone community um, and you can see that even looking 2034, 2035, still probably about five out of every six folks will be white alone. The Hispanic population is a subset of any of the other population um, segments and uh, or race segments. And so um, you can be white alone and have Hispanic origin. You could be black alone, have Hispanic origin. But about one out of every five folks um, is uh, has a Hispanic descent uh, associated with their race. And then from an income level perspective, you are a little uh, lower than the state and a little lower than the, um, the U.S. as a whole. And kind of what this equates to is, is you really want to consider um, and really always want to provide high quality experiences. However, the, the desire um, is not so much about cost recovery. In other words, charging fees to cover the cost of programs and services. Um, that is the overall philosophy now and it will likely be the overall philosophy going forward. This does not mean that you won't look to recover costs at all, um, but there is going, and there will be opportunities to recover costs for programs and services in the future, um, but it's not going to be this carte blanche where you're going to try to recover 60, 70, 80% of your costs, uh, operate, operational costs. So focus group and stakeholders, um, probably close to, Brian can uh, correct my math on this, but probably 15 to 20 different um, fo focus group stakeholder meetings were held, including a public meeting. And without getting into um, all of the minutia, what I just wanted to try and uh, summarize for you is some of the key themes that came out of that those conversations. Um, really, there was a lot of strong advocacy for Parks and Recreation and uh, an appreciation for the system as it exists today. Um, there was an expressed desire, um, concern, how was the uh, system going to keep up with the growth um, that I just showed you. Um, indoor recreation spaces needed, uh, and that came up in every focus group that we spoke to. Um, trails, 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 whether it be loop trails in parks, whether it be long linear trails, whether it be um, multi-use paved paths, or whether it be soft surface trails, uh, that was a key theme that came up. There was a recognition that community special events and art and culture is a key fabric component of your community, um, and it is also very much appreciated. More awareness of offerings are des is desired. Um, you know, always talk with folks, and I think sometimes it's just information overload, um, but sometimes people don't find out about things until after the fact. That was expressed as part of the key themes. And then, of course, if your system's going to grow, how are you going to pay for it? Um, both uh, whether it be capitally, whether it be operationally, and as we discussed um, at, at kind of the, the kickoff of this, um, that everything that you build has a life cycle to it. And that life cycle in a park system never stops. So if a playground's going to last 15 years, 
you don't put all your playgrounds in in 2019 and then have to replace them in 2034. They're staggered in terms of when they're constructed, so there's always going to be a staggering associated with the life cycle replacement of that. So the project website, and this kind of gives you a snapshot of the um, one of the screens associated with it, um, but uh, what I did was we had received a number of participation comments, very, very, some of them were very high level, some of them were, were very much um, granular. Um, so instead of trying to give you an idea of every comment, what we want to do is just kind of put together a word cloud. So of course you can see bikes, trails, indoor facilities, parks, um, uh, splash pads, um, even comments about if the cattle were going to return um, <laughs> showed up. And, and so um, it just kind of gives you a sense of uh, what people were commenting on uh, with regards to the website. Ironically, and you'll see this as we go forward, a lot of these same comments were realized as part of the statistically valid survey. All right. So if you like numbers, you're in for a treat. If you don't like numbers, <laughs> you might want to see if you have some caffeine. <laughs> Handy. Um, so we did the statistically valid survey. We purposely waited until all the kids were back in school. Um, we launched this project uh, really April, May. Um, and it was too soon to put the statistically valid survey out. Um, normally, we would want to do it right on the heels of all of the, the public input, um, but we didn't want to do it during the summer. Um, we recognize that it becomes a little bit more challenging. People's lives are a little bit um, less routine during the summer. And so we waited purposely to, to do it in, in August and September um, and even into early October. And our goal was to receive 375 complete surveys and we received 402. What a statistically valid survey means is that you, the ETC um, is charged with making sure that the representation um, responses that, that the responses that came from the survey are representative of your community geographically and demographically. And I can tell you that they hit the mark um, once again. We've worked with ETC for close to 25 years and, and they always do their job. But basically what this a statistically valid survey means is that if you did this same survey 95 or 100 times, you would get the same results 95 times um, with a margin of error of about 5%. So this is where all of the surveys were collected from. And you can see it's a really good geographic representation of where people live in your community, um, both in terms of density, uh, location, as well as density. This is kind of the, the scatter plot map that we expected to receive, and we're happy to report that we did receive that. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned, they, they hit the mark. And so this is this these results are representative of your community as a whole. So I've broken this up into kind of chunks. I'm not going to go through every last question and every last slide, but kind of the key components of it. And the first section is park and facility visitation and condition. So the first question we asked was whether or not people had um, had visited parks over the last 12 months. Um, and you can see that your larger parks, regional community parks, were the ones that people visited the most. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, they're intended to draw people from the entire community. Your neighborhood parks are just that. They are expected to serve just the neighborhood or neighborhoods that they are uh, located in. And pocket parks even more so, just simply because those are typically less than an acre in size. So uh, to summarize it though, 88% of Prescott Valley residents visited parks and facilities over the last 12 months. The national benchmark for that is 76%. So tie it back to what we heard qualitatively, people have an uh, appreciation for the park system. As far as condition goes, so the dark blue lines give you an understanding of each of the parks that they rated highly in terms of an excellent condition rating. 
the blue, the lighter blue, it means that people indicated that they were in good condition. Um, the uh, orange or uh, burnt orange, yellow is more fair, and you can see very, very, very few parks were rated as poor. Long story short, when you summarize all of this information, 29% um, of your, an excellent condition rating was rated at 29% um, for your system. And that is on par with what we see from a, a condition rating um, uh, across the country. So again, not only are people using your parks, um, but they're rating the, the quality of them as very high. Uh, this speaks to well-maintained parks. It speaks to parks that um, are safe. Uh, and it also speaks to the fact that you don't have a lot of infrastructure in your parks that feel neglected. As far as reasons for not visiting parks, and I told staff this this afternoon, I would not be all that concerned with this because 88% of your residents visited parks over the last 12 months. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how people are not aware of parks or facilities, um, but uh, they are, you know, that was the highest. But I can tell you one thing that I would point out that is, I think, a, a huge compliment to the town as a whole, to public safety, to maintenance is the fact that only 4% of your community who didn't use parks didn't use them because they didn't feel safe. And that number is about a third to a fourth of what we see nationally. So that's a huge compliment to the town as a whole. Programmed participation and quality. 41% of your residents participated in events, programs, and services provided by Parks and Recreation. The national benchmark for participation is 33%. However, um, the excellent rating and the good rating for the quality of the programs is a little bit less than we normally see. So here's my take on this knowing your system, um, anecdotally, as well as some of the deep dive we've done. I think part and parcel, this is, people answer this question in a couple of different ways. Do you have good instructors? I'm, I know based on conversations with staff that you do, but do you have the right spaces to hold programs? If you don't have the right spaces, it's really high to have, it's really hard to have high quality programs. Um, and the other thing is, is because you don't have the right spaces, you probably aren't able to offer the programs that people are looking for. So as far as reasons why people did not participate, um, the number one was too busy, not interested. Um, and I think this speaks to the just the simple fact that I think you're not offering programs in the right spaces because you don't have the right spaces, and because you don't have the right spaces, you're not able to offer programs that they're most interested in. That's my big takeaway from this. As far as I don't know what is offered, um, I have seen that number be much, much higher, and in fact, it is in line with the national benchmark of 35%. So um, again, I, I would couch this by saying this is based on people that haven't participated and your numbers for people participating in your programs and services is much greater than that national benchmark. So take this with somewhat of a grain of salt. As, and uh, this is also um, really interesting information. How do people learn about programs and activities? Um, so your top five or six, five, are website or uh, your water bill insert, the uh, friends and neighbors, newspaper, Facebook, and the town website. Here's the ultimate question. How would people prefer to learn? Water bill insert, newspaper, Facebook, town website, and then email and email blasts. 
And so the only thing that um, I think is, is what's going on is basically I think you have a lot of folks talking about your system, talking about your programs and activities, and they're learning about that from their friends and neighbors. However, the problem is, is we know the play the telephone game, right? Um, and how the message gets lost in translation. And also, um, when you learn from friends and neighbors, typically people share their experiences after something has occurred, not before. That said, how you are communicating is exactly how people want to be communicated with. So you don't need to change anything in the next five to 10 years with regards to your top five or six ways in which you're marketing your department. May I interpret, have a question? Yes. The, the percentage for cable was very, I'm sorry? very low. The percentage for cable on the slide Oh, before, cable TV? Very low. Very, very low, yes. Uh, is that something we should look into? It's only um, on local channels. Well, I think, though, that people aren't preferring that as a way of getting communicated with, um, and so I don't think it's worth the, the resources. I think you have your marketing ways in which you are getting the information out, so it's not just a matter of how people are learning, but how they would prefer to learn. Okay. So what's happening is, is how people are learning is in line with how they would prefer to learn about your programs and services. All right, yeah. Okay. I understand, yes. That's excellent. It's the first time I've ever been able to say that uh, in <laughs> all my years doing this. Usually it's like we got to go back to the drawing board and redo our marketing plan um, and shift our resources around. So you guys are dialed in, which is great. Um, so we wanted to dive into needs. Um, and so... The programs that people in your community feel to be most important to them, community special events was one, fitness and wellness programs was another, open swim was a third, senior programs and services is a fourth, water fitness programs fifth, target shooting sixth, art classes seventh. This is the what people feel are the most important programs to them. And you can see, just anecdotally, knowing your department as you do, you can see what it is that you do and what it is that you don't. And here's the kicker. Where do people have their highest unmet needs? So in other words, if people find something important, are you doing it? And where they want more programs, community special events, open swim, fitness and wellness programs, senior services, water fitness, target shooting, and even art classes came in eighth on this list. So um, when you start thinking about why people haven't participated or quality of programs, it may simply be that you're not in at this point able to offer the programs or enough of the programs that people find most important. When you have a high unmet need, and it aligns with importance, that is a beacon of light. Um, and it really starts to help prioritize where you look to expand your programs. It doesn't mean that you don't do the things at the bottom of the list. It just simply means that if you're going to reinvest and start to do more of something, this is a starting point for you. So art and culture programs and activity needs. Um, we looked at the needed, and you can see that community festivals was, again, one. Music was two. Programs in parks, three. After school programs, four. Theater, five. Um, I uh, said this to staff. When you think about a parks and recreation department, if they don't necessarily have an art and culture wing to it um, or, you know, its own function and art and culture commission, Community festivals, programs in parks, and after-school programs are typically a part of your recreation division. And so there is um, some good crossover and some synergy there. In terms of importance, um, again, very much the same alignment. And so uh, I think it, it starts to help you prioritize from an art and culture perspective, art and entertainment, um, where you um, want to continue to, to put your focus. Special event concepts, um, 
these were kind of drilled down a little bit further in terms of uh, if people, we kind of thought people would say special events was a, a big deal in your community, and it is, came out of all of the focus group and stakeholder stuff. Uh, so staff um, put some thought into crafting a question um, related to the type of concepts that they would like to see. So of course, more entertainment here at the Civic Center. It's your hub. Um, cultural celebrations and festivals and food and beverage were the top three. When you start to think about what do they want to see at the Findlay Toyota Center, entertainment, cultural events, home business um, fairs, uh, public ice skating. So you can start to see that there is a lot of synergy between what we saw on the recreation program side of the equation, the art and culture side of the equation, and drilling it down further, what people want out of special events, since that was most important and most um, needed and had the highest unmet need, whether they were answering it from a recreation perspective or an art and culture perspective. So when we look at facility amenities and needs, what you hope to see is you hope to see that the experiences, the programs and services that people want, that they say, okay, well, if we're gonna want these programs and services, we need the right spaces for them. And your community nailed it. Um, so when swimming is um, really, really high on the list, um, and people want to fitness and exercise, you of course see that the most important facilities and amenities are going to be out indoor aquatics, aquatics generally, walking trails, shooting ranges which supports the target shooting, um, recreation multi-gen center um, that supports fitness and wellness programs and art classes. Um, open space conservation. Uh, again, these are the, the top five that you typically, we don't typically see. Um, walking trails, trails generally is number one. The only other place that I have seen where aquatics trumps um, the uh, walking and biking trails is in Boulder, Colorado, oh. which similar climate, similar elevation, different community, uh, major university town, but also a town known for its biathlons and triathlons and Ironman um, competitions. And so we talked a little bit about that as a staff, uh, with staff this afternoon, that you really are set up well, just geography wise, to be able to support that type of uh, person wanting to live here. Um, and so if you start to think about some of the things that go into that, the ability to have a trail system to run and bike on, to have pools available 12 months a year, really support that. As far as unmet needs, same alignment that we saw with programs, um, other than the restroom buildings, uh, which I know is a hot topic um, already um, for parks and recreation, but aquatics was number one, restroom buildings in your parks was number two, walking, biking, trails three and four, multi-gen center five, shooting range is six, an adventure area, so what does that mean? Zip lines, ropes courses, um, BMX tracks, um, pump tracks. Uh, so you have a lot of alignment with, again, what's important from a facility and amenity perspective with the unmet needs. And all of your facility and amenity desires um, align with the programs and services that people are asking for. This doesn't happen very often. Um, so when we think about public support, and I mentioned qualitatively that you all uh, had a lot of advocacy and appreciation for the system. We asked the uh, community um, what their level of agreement was with all of the benefits that Parks and Recreation provides. Um, you are in the strongly agree to agree category from a range of 87% at the top to 62% at the bottom. That is exceptionally strong. You know, when we ask these questions, we typically start to see the, the ones at the bottom fall off into the 30s and 40%, but you have a, a, a community that very much appreciates and, and will advocate for parks and recreation. 
we asked um, questions uh, related to what they thought were most important to uh, do, um, and I've just kind of summarized this based on what would people. So, if you want us, to, if you want all this stuff, what are you willing to pay for? Uh, that's where the rubber starts to meet the road. The very, very, very first thing was develop a new recreation center. Second was to purchase land for open space, which I'll be honest, I find kind of mind boggling <laughs> because you're surrounded by open space, but I get it. I get the mindset that um, it's a growing community. It's starting to get more dense. Uh, traffic becomes a concern. So of course, people always want open space. Um, develop walking and biking trails take care of what you already have, improve the existing part, trail system. And, and so these are your top actions and even improve restroom facilities and parks. Um, these are the top actions that people are willing to, to most fund. So they weren't just dreaming. They weren't asking for a wish list and then saying they didn't want to fund it. They were willing to, to fund these items as well. So how does this all shape up from a community needs perspective? We take all the quantitative stuff, the qualitative stuff, throw it in a blender and no, have it kind of spit out. Um, but we, we do this um, very, very uh, similarly uh, in which ETC goes through the process of trying to um, get responses. And so there's uh, some definitely math to it. Instead of trying to break it down 1 through 30 or 1 through 35, we identify what's highest priority, medium priority, and low priority. So from a recreation programs and services prioritize needs. This means that if you are going to expand programs and services, do more of something that you're either not doing or doing, but you need to do more of. Community special events, fitness and wellness programs, open swim, senior programs and services, water fitness programs, target shooting. That's your highest priority right now from a programs and services. The second tier is, um, a lot related to some art and culture, but a lot of outdoor recreation experiences, whether it be environmental education, whether it be outdoor recreation or a combination thereof, including um, some after school programs uh, as well as um, programs with special needs. The things on the right, the lowest priority, this does not mean that you stop doing this. It just means that right now you're doing a good job of meeting these needs, so continue to move forward. However, these programs and then the associated amenities and facilities will likely have to grow and expand as your population grows and expands. So it doesn't mean that just because you offer three sessions of volleyball today that you're going to get away with being able to offer three sessions of volleyball um, or three nights of volleyball um, in the future because your population is going to grow. Um, the other thing that you recognize about all these programs is, is many of them are very sport specific which means they are very skill specific, special interest specific, and also very age specific. So the things that appeal to the community as a whole, even target shooting, um, you're in a rural, still in a rural community, that is something that appeals to the community as a whole, which means you're gonna have more of the community as a whole want to participate in those programs and services. The things in the lower priority, Yes, they are always a priority. You're not going to not have baseball. You're not going to not have soccer. You're not going to not have football uh, or pickleball um, or tennis or things along those lines. It's just that right now, the offerings in your community are right-sized. So when we talk about park facility and amenity prioritization, again, not a surprise. Aquatics, trails, restroom buildings, shooting ranges, multi-gen recreation centers, adventure courses, open space conservation. Those are your highest priorities. Same goes with the same conversation that I said about medium priority and low priority. You have 
you want to aggressively pursue opportunity to support the medium priority, but not at the rate that you would the things at the highest priority. And again, the things on the lower priority doesn't mean you pack up and go home and you're not going to have any more baseball fields or skate parks or pickleball courts. It just means that right now you're doing a good job of, of meeting those needs. Um, and we will address this a little bit further as we get into the level of service stuff. And art and culture programs, again, um, very similar to, to what you saw previously. So the overall emerging issues indoor recreation spaces needed, in particular aquatics. Continue to take care of what you already have. And I, I emphasize continue because you had an excellent condition rating in line with the national benchmark and you have 88% of your community using your parks. Trails, trails, trails. Um, community special events, art and culture, continue to expand upon those. Target shooting is desired. Um, continue to build advocacy through your awareness efforts. And you have strong advocacy. You don't want to rest on your laurels. You want to create even greater advocacy as you look to implement your master plan. And then, of course, um, developing the financial strategies to support not just the expansion based on today's population, but the expansion of your system based on it growing from potentially 50,000 people, almost doubling to um, 95,000 people in 15 years. So our next steps, um, program and service assessment. We're gonna do all of this um, over the, basically between now and uh, Christmas. Um, program and service assessment. Um, park uh, maintenance assessment, the level of service standards, and just um, for the newbies, um, that means how much new stuff do you need to plan to build over the next 15 years. Um, that aligns with the prioritized needs of the community. Um, service equity mapping uh, for both parks as a whole and individual amenities. So do you have good distribution of ramadas, playgrounds, dog parks, um, athletic fields? And we will be developing a for your existing parks um, a park by park improvement scenario that will ultimately roll into a capital improvement plan. Questions, concerns, comments, suggestions. I think this lots is of information. Extremely <laughs> interesting, Mike. Very, very interesting. It, 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 I'm delighted that it's so positive for our community. But this is this was a great presentation. Well, I think I think it's a lot of what I expected, but there are certainly some areas that catch your attention and. Uh, I think this will be really valuable for us as we go forward. Um, the question I have, and, and we've talked about it from the beginning, is we have all these planned communities with their facilities and tying them in. Now, how are we going to look at that? I know that'll be towards the end of the process. Yes, I can, I can answer that and say that, yes, there are um, uh, a lot, I guess a lot is a, a relative term, but there are HOA parks and there are some amenities associated with that. But it will be surprised when we present the information to you about the inventory in January mm -hmm. that there's not as much as you would think. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that puts it back on us. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it does help to support. Um, but I think that, um, for example, I think within the HOAs, based on the information that we have, there's one swimming pool. It's not like there's three or four uh, neighborhood HOAs that have, you know, swimming pools in them. You know, Granville has uh, an 8,000 square foot community center, but not every HOA or planned community has that. Now, will future master planned HOAs have those amenities? Absolutely but the level of service standard will start to help and define from a recreation perspective what are the things that should be added as part of those HOA communities. So will it, for aquatics, let's say, be a collaboration with the HOA and the town to meet the needs of specifically, say, a pool? Like, if, if the HOA will promise a pool, then 
Obviously, the town doesn't have to provide it. But will there be a communication in regards to that? I matter? think that uh, I think going forward, I think um, aquatics is obviously going to be a big deal. Looks like a very um, big but, deal on your presentation. But the one thing that HOAs will not build, which I think is where your community is leaning towards, is indoor pools. So they may build their, you know larger, grandiose, you know, I don't want to make this sound bad, but your typical hole in the ground swimming pool, but they're not going to build a, a, a recreational pool that has slides and, you know, play elements and zero depth entries and bubblers and things along those lines. They will build those pools that give people opportunities to cool off and lap swim, but they're not going to build a $6 million aquatic park. And they're certainly not going to build an indoor pool. Um, so it, again, it, it kind of is like the people have pools in their backyards. When you do the work down in the valley, yes, you know what? You can start to think, you know, all you do is look at an aerial and see all the people that have pools in their backyards, and the need for a community pool becomes less. Well, you don't necessarily have that situation here. Yeah. The other thing is, is your existing outdoor pool is near the end of its life. Mountain Valley. Um, yeah, That's... and it's it's definitely um, in need of whether it be refurbishment, renovation, upgrade, or replacement um, at some point from an outdoor pool perspective. But one of the things that we started to see when we start thinking about aquatics is people want it indoors, which means they want it 12 months a year. Would it be possible to convert? Outdoor to indoor? Uh, I've or seen like it have done. Two projects going. I've, I've seen it done. Um, you know that that probably wouldn't be it's, a cost-effective option for us. The pool is um, towards the end of its life, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, that I think we have to look at is the climate truly is changing, and we see that in our statistics when we see the number of days. The pool has to be closed because of weather. Um, and there are some years that it's really significant. And that means nobody can use it during those times. So the concept of an indoor facility might be something to look forward to. But there again, it comes down to the financing. Do we know if any of the Fane family were fond swimmers? <laughs> I do not, but... And Brian, and I wasn't sure if I was going to say this or not, but of course the, the conversation with regards to the YMCA um, certainly is something that you look at the information presented and you look at the experiences that people want and the facilities and amenities. With a YMCA, you could potentially check a couple of those boxes. Um, again, I think this is helpful information to help guide those conversations as they go forward as well. Um, I have a question about the homeowners association pools are, and this coordinating. Does that mean they're they're going to become open to the public, not just the residents in that homeowners association? Typically, um, what I would call those, uh, they would be as if your town had neighborhood pools in kind of neighborhood parks. And HOAs, people pay fees, and those are typically used by just HOA residents and guests. Um, uh, we haven't had conversation with the HOAs to understand how much their facilities are actually being used. We're just counting it from an inventory perspective. Um, but it, it, they, they provide neighborhood pools or pools that are meant to serve their HOA, which is why they won't get in the business of doing indoor pools and or like mini water parks, so to speak. Yeah, I think it would be very unlikely that those I would say probably HOAs zero. would <laughs> would allow outside, you know, use. So yeah, if if they ended up, I, I can speak to this um, just simply from past experience. If they ended up with pools at the end of their useful life and they weren't being used, the likelihood of them rebuilding a pool is probably unlikely. Especially if you end up getting an indoor pool of some sort that can provide those services 12 months a year. Well, this is certainly going to guide us in the right direction. It's a start. 
<laughs> the next piece will be more numbers for you, but it'll be maps as well. So if you like numbers and maps, love them. Uh, we'll be back in January. I think the <laughs> second full week in January is uh, when we'll be back to present that info. I cannot wait. This awesome. Just <laughs> Mike, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very, very much, Mike. It's really great. Okay, moving on, we will go to other. I don't think there is any other. So we will move to unscheduled public appearances. And I see we have some folks in the audience. Um, did you, did any of you want to speak? Okay, well, you don't have to speak. We just give you the opportunity. But keep in mind what Mike's saying. This is an ongoing process, and we really love to have you come. Um, these sessions, of course, are live streamed, so you can watch them on the internet and gather information if you have questions. Um, the Brian Whitty is the Parks and Rec Director. He was available to answer any questions or comments you have. And with that, I'll say thank you for coming out and listening to it tonight. Good. Okay, moving on to the next item is item 12, and we're going to uh, mention that we have a regular meeting on Tuesday, January 14th, 2020 at 6.30 in the auditorium, but we want to have a motion to have a work study at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, November 19th, um, probably in the Civic Center. So do we have a motion for that? I make a motion that we have a work study at the Civic Center on Tuesday, November 19th at 4 p.m. And a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? And it passes. Thank you very much. Uh, again, our agenda will be very specific, and this will be pertaining to uh, the onboarding, if you will, of our three new commissioners. Uh, so we'll be focusing on an orientation process um, so that, therefore, we can have uh, conversation uh, amongst the sitting commissioners. And, of course, uh, with that, we'll have uh, Chairperson Gummer back with us as well as also Vice Chair uh, Pollican. So doing those types of things. But we'll just re be reviewing general operations, meeting schedules, all of those types of different things as well as open meeting and all the other fun things that go into the basic uh, processes of orientation for the commission. Very good. Thank you. And with that, um, do I have a motion for adjournment? I make a motion that this meeting be adjourned. And a second? A second. second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>